And we're turning now to the, firstly, to the Gospel by Luke. The Gospel by Luke, please. I'm reading in chapter number four. We saw this afternoon that man was defeated and sin was triumphant. And now we're turning our attention to this first great battle that took place at the beginning of the public ministry of the Lord Jesus. You notice that for 40 days at the beginning of the public ministry of the Lord Jesus, he was tempted of the devil. Now, there were 40 days at the end of the public ministry of the Lord Jesus after he rose from the dead when the devil never troubled him at all for the simple reason that by the time we turn to Acts chapter 1, the cross has taken place and the devil has been decisively defeated. But here he attacks the Savior. Verse 1, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Now can we turn our attention please just to Colossians in chapter number 1. Paul's epistle to the Colossians please. And reading in chapter number 1. And reading, please, at verse number uh, 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. The epistle to the Hebrews, please, in chapter number 2. The epistle to the Hebrews, please, and reading in chapter number 2 and at verse number 14. Forasmuch then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And can we turn, please, to the epistle to the Philippians and chapter number 2. Philippians, please, and reading in chapter number 2 and verse number 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. 
Now that will suffice just at the moment for the reading of the Word of God. We will address your minds to some other scriptures as the meeting progresses. Now we saw this afternoon, as we've said already, that the adversary seemed to score and win a great victory in the Garden of Eden, and he has seen his plan and his purpose. It would appear to be gradually come to the stage where it might move forward to fruition. But what I want to deal with uh, this evening is what the Apostle Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians and in chapter number 15. I don't ask you to turn to it, but I'm just going to read it, and I'm sure that these verses are well known to you, just as it is. Verse number 45 of that chapter says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a life, a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which was spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. Now what I want to deal with very briefly, and we will look at some of the epistle ministry regarding the state of unsaved man, but what the apostle is teaching us here, that the Lord, there is a man who was the first man, Adam. Now you see, actually, when I gave the little headings to our brother, uh, I uh, made, well, I really wrote something that wasn't scripturally true, and I was aware of doing it, because we speak of the first Adam and the last Adam, but the Bible speaks of the first man Adam and the last Adam, and it speaks about the first man and the second man. Now the first man is, of course, Adam, and the second man is the Lord Jesus. And what the Apostle is teaching is that there is, in human history, the head of two races. There is Adam's race, and we will see this afternoon the feature and the character of Adam's race. And then there is that race that finds its head in the second man, who, of course, we have read that he is also the last Adam. So the Lord Jesus is the second man, and the Lord Jesus is the last Adam. Now in what sense is he the second man, and in what sense is he the last Adam? He is the second man because there was not another between him and the first Adam. In other words, he was not the third, he was not the fourth, he was the second. So we say quite clearly in that expression, the second man, we say that there was none like him before him. He was the second man. None like him before him. The first man was different and then came the second man. None like him. But when we say that he was the last man, Adam, we say that there was none after him. And that is the difference between him, them. The second, none before him. There was the first. The second, there was none before him. But when we deal with him being the last Adam, uh, we are saying that there was none after him. Now we're going to come back to that in a few moments. But I want very briefly, first of all, just to tell you the state that we were in once sin came and claimed us. And I'm going to turn to scripture, and I don't ask uh, you to turn to it, but you will see the definition of the human race very clearly writ as a result of sin. Now you sat very well this afternoon, it's a long time to sit for an hour and a half, and we'll try to make it as easy to listen to as possible. Uh, we're just speaking, the one thing we will not make it is fun, you know. Uh, everybody nowadays says that things have got to be fun. I was looking at a little uh, school book maybe six months ago in the house I was, and it said this, the title of the book was Mathematics is Fun. Well, I never found it fun. And I don't know how you could possibly make mathematics fun. But nowadays you see everything's got to be fun. And we will see that that's a quite uh, anti-scriptural approach to life. Being a Christian is a serious business. It's no fun. It's been a serious business, and it's a joyful business. Now, the first thing we notice about uh, sin, and uh, you don't need to turn to it, I'm turning to Romans chapter number 5 as I speak to you, and I just want to point out something about sin. Listen to what the Apostle says. As by one man sin entered into the world, we dealt with us, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now bear that in mind, we all have sinned. Now what was sin? Sin in the Garden of Eden was breaking a specific commandment. Now you got that? That's vital. Sin was breaking a specific commandment. Well you say, you don't need to come from Scotland to tell me that. 
No, that's right. But that is the base from which Paul argues. Now listen to what he says. Nevertheless, despite that, he says, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. What does he mean? He means this, that Adam sinned in that he broke a specific commandment. Now, have you got that? I'm sure you have. Can I say it again? Adam sinned because he broke a specific commandment. And you're saying, well, we know that, preacher, hurry up. Have a listen. What commandment did they break? Those who were the descendants of Adam. I'm glad there's silence. Because they had no commandment. There was no commandment. There was no commandment until the law was given. So you cannot say of people between Eden and the law that they broke a commandment. If you say that to me tonight, I'll say, I'll hand you my Bible and say, show me it. Maybe in North America you've got a different Bible. I know you don't have. So, what is Paul I say, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. They did not sin after the similitude of Adam's transgression. They didn't break a specific, but they still died. They still died. And therefore, because they still died, they must still have been sinners. Do you see the point? If they were still sinners, they must have been sinners on not the basis of breaking a specific commandment. Why then were they sinners? Ah, here's a new thing. Not new, but new in the epistle to the Romans. What Paul is saying is this. They did not die because they committed a sin. They died because they inherited a sinful nature. That's the point at issue there. They inherited a sinful nature. And therefore we learn two things. That I go to a lost eternity if I'm not saved. Supposing, and it could never be. Supposing I said, well, I don't really think I've sinned. And that's impossible. But supposing you might say, well, I would argue that. No, even if you argued that you had not committed a sin, you're going to a lost eternity because you inherited a sinful nature with your links from Adam. That's why the older brethren used to teach us that we are sinners by nature and by practice. So Paul has argued there that death passed upon all men, not because they broke a specific command, but because they inherited a sinful nature which caused them to sin and break even the commandments that they did not know existed. Now keep that in mind. Now this completely excludes in Romans 5 the question of conscience and the question of light from creation. I'm not coming into that. That is all things that were impressed in these people. But Paul is not arguing from that point here. He is simply saying they were sinners because they inherited a sinful nature. In other words, a child who is born is a sinner from the moment of birth. They don't become sinners when they first sin. Now that is vital to an understanding uh, we will see of the great message of redemption. For this reason, and I'll come back to it, that I, in the Bible, I sin quite apart from, I'm a sinner quite apart from my actions. Praise God for such a truth. Because in the gospel, I am righteous without reference to my actions. And if I am a sinner because of my links with Adam, I am righteous because of my links with Jesus Christ. So we've got the basic principle here of what is called federal headship. Well, of course, yes, that's right in America, isn't it? Federal. That's a good American word. Federal headship. Now I know where it came from. Uh, in that, my links with Adam made me part of that family, and I'm a sinner apart from my actions. 
My links with the Lord Jesus make me righteous apart from my actions. Praise God for that because I could not be righteous on the basis of my actions. It's not possible. But I'm righteous apart from my actions because of my links with Jesus Christ. Now that is very fundamental and not everybody understands that. Maybe you all do in North America, but no, everybody understands that. However, now, so what was the first result of the fall? Death, Romans 5. Now what was the second result of the fall? Not only were we subject to death, but in Romans chapter 6, we learn that we became subject to a despot. Now I haven't, invite, I haven't invented that word so it's got a D. It actually does exist. A despot. You know what a despot is? A tyrant. A tyrant. I'm subject to a tyrant. As a sinner, I am the slave of a tyrant. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 6? He says this, that I am the servant of sin. I am sin's servant. And so, if in Romans 5, I became subject to death because of sin. In Romans 6, I became subject to a despot. Sin ruled me, reigned me, controlled me. And so, when a sinner says to you, an unsaved sinner says to you, I did that and I couldn't help it, there's a measure of truth in that, a measure of truth in that he and she are under a despot who controls them. Behind them there is the devil. But sin, I am the servant of sin. Just think of that. Now, you see, the devil said, sin and you will be free. The fact was, sin and you become a slave. Now, I want you to notice the third thing. In Colossians chapter 1, in Romans 5, I'm subject to death. In Romans 6, I'm subject to a despot. In Romans, in Colossians 1, I'm subject to darkness. I'm in darkness. Now, it's called the kingdom of darkness in Colossians chapter number 1. It just is a little picture of Egypt in Colossians 1. So we are subject to darkness. Now, I was saying, I think it was in Sarnia, I'm not sure. If it was the folks from Sarnia, well, excuse me for repeating it. Darkness is a strange thing. Here we are tonight. Now, if this was the middle of the day, the sun would be shining. And what I could do, I could board up all of these windows... And I could exclude the sun, and in the midst of the sun I would be sitting in darkness. I can keep out the sun. If I wish I can sit in my house, and I can pull down the blinds, or close them, or do whatever you do, and I'm subject to darkness. In the middle of the sun, I'm in darkness. But here we are tonight, and it's dark outside. It's dark outside. And supposing, we're not speaking about electric light now, Somebody said to me down at Pensocken, you know, how modern is Scotland? I said, well, we've got electric light. <laughs> <laughs> and then I added, here and there. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, they say about Scotsmen, we're so generous that when you come to us, we say, come to my house and gather round my roaring candle. You know, <laughs> keeps you nice and warm. However, that, by the way, that's got nothing to do with Colossians 1, by the way. <laughs> You see, here I am, I'm sitting, and it's dark. Supposing I boarded up the windows, I could not keep out the darkness. I can keep out light, but I cannot exclude darkness. Now, I'm not talking about artificial, I'm not talking about light, I'm talking about the light of the sun. I can keep out light, but I cannot keep out darkness. In other words, in the human heart, I can keep out light, but I cannot by human means keep out darkness. The only way I can keep out darkness is wait till the sun shines in. In other words, I can exclude light, but only God can give me light. I cannot exclude God. Now, in Colossians 1, we are told that we are subject to darkness, the kingdom of darkness. Now, just keep that in mind. Now, I want you to see that in Ephesians chapter 2, we're subject to something else. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're subject to disobedience. And so, when we read that beautiful second chapter of the Ephesians, we read that we are the sons of disobedience, verse 2. 
We are the sons of disobedience. Now, if you look at Ephesians 2 and 2, you find this. He says, you hath he quickened. You hath he given life who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, there is no more hopeless a case than being dead. Nobody, the material that God had to work on in the gospel was, humanly speaking, hopeless material. Nobody could do anything for dead things. But praise God. God, the material, matter of fact, if you look at Romans, Ephesians 2, you'll find that he speaks about the material God had to work on, which was dead, the motive God had, which was love, and the manifest manifestation of that was, of course, to be displayed in the workmanship of Jesus Christ. But we were sons of disobedience. Now keep that in mind. So we were subject to death, and we were subject to darkness, and we were subject to disobedience. And this is all just a little picture of what it was before the Lord Jesus uh, came in. Now, I want you to notice also, please, that in Romans, in Ephesians 2, and in Romans 5, you'll find again, we were subject to distance. We were at a distance from God. So the material's hopeless, dead, subject to a despot, living in darkness, sons of disobedience, and at a distance from God. And you hath he reconciled, says Paul, because we were subject to distance. There was between us a division. I'm not thinking of the dividing wall of Ephesians. I'm thinking of the fact that there was a matter that divided us, set us apart, and at a distance from God. Now that is the condition of sinners. Now, I'm going to turn now, please, to Luke chapter number four. So what are we going to look at? We're going to look first at, at two confrontations. We're going to look between at these two confrontations at one time of great combat. We're going to look at the contrast between before and after the cross. And uh, if time allows, we'll look at the consequences in 1 Corinthians 15. In case you haven't noticed, they all start with a C. And uh, I better not say too much about alliteration. There's some people here who don't like it, but there we are. Now, Luke chapter 4. Let me make it quite clear at the very beginning that the Lord Jesus could not sin. We do not say that the Lord Jesus was able not to sin. We say that the Lord Jesus was not able to sin. It was not possible for the Saviour to sin. Now you might say to me, well if it was not possible for him to sin, what was the point of the temptations? There was a number of reasons. The first is that as a man he had to experience what all men experience. And we all experience temptation. And he experienced it as well. We learn about that by the way. It is not sinful to be tempted. It is sinful to fall to the temptation. Now young believers, remember that. It's not sinful to be tempted, but it is sinful to fall to the temptation. The devil will tempt. Tempted the Lord Jesus. And so the Lord Jesus, one of the reasons he went through the temptation was so that in all point he would be tempted and tested as we are, yet quite apart from the sin question altogether. He could not sin. Now I want you to just examine these temptations. I want you to notice first of all when they took place. They took place after the Lord Jesus had been baptized and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was led. Uh, Mark says he was driven into the wilderness. Now I want you to notice, please, what these three temptations are. Here is what the devil will do to you. This is a picture of how to handle temptation. I want you to observe, please, the difference between these three temptations. It took place after the, after the great time of baptism, when you would least expect it. And what was spiritually should have been a high point, then the devil calls. I tell you, he will come calling at the most unexpected moments. Now look at these three temptations and come with me down them. The first temptation, what was it? Command the stone that it be made bread. What is this? He attacks dealing with the problem of sustenance. How are you going to live, man? Now, the devil will attack you from that. He'll say, look, this old Christianity that you've got, do you know that, that how, are you, how are you going to live? You're giving yourself over to the service of Jesus Christ. I tell you, you've got to earn a living for yourself and your wife, etc. How can you live? 
It may well be that you get the opportunity to get another job that means that you can't get to the meetings. And the devil says, take it. How will you live without the extra money? And so he deals with the problem of sustenance. I want you to notice the second temptation. And he says to the Lord Jesus, he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. All this power will I give unto thee. It's now not sustenance, but sovereignty. Is that I'll make you sovereign. Uh, you, you think you lost it? You think you, you think you lost it in the fall? You are God's vice regent. I'll give you that back again. I will give back to you what you think you lost in the fall. I'll prove to you that I can give man back what man lost in the fall. And so he's promising sovereignty, power, promotion, whatever you call it. He's saying, follow me and I'll make you talks. By the way, there's a kind of gospel preaching goes on, prosperity gospel that says if you get saved by the grace of God, you'll prosper in your job and you'll prosper financially. That's a lie from the pit. The Bible never teaches that. And then the third one is uh, the scripture, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up. That is the practice of scripture. The, that's what he's dealing with there. The practice of Scripture is saying, I'm going to tell you that there is a little verse here that tells me that you can cast yourself down. Now, we're going to examine these three. Now, I've given you three little headings, but that's not the headings we're going to work on. I want you to notice the first one. Now, I've said it before. The first one is the question of provision, verse 3 and verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone. Now, uh, the Lord Jesus. Now, do you notice how the Lord Jesus answers these? He answers them by quoting from an Old Testament book. What Old Testament book is it? You all know, don't you? I wouldn't say tell me. It's the book of Deuteronomy. He quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. That tells me it's worth reading. The book of Deuteronomy. You know, folks hear about the book of Deuteronomy. Well, it's just, it's just the old law given again. Well, that proves you've never read the book of Deuteronomy. And so he quotes from the book. But do you notice his defense? His defense is to say, it is written, it is written, it is said. Now what do we learn from that? We learn this. That defense against Satan's temptations must be based on scripture. And that Satan cannot answer scripture. Now can I say something here? If you do not know scripture, you cannot use that scripture. What does the Bible call scripture? It's the sword. You take up the sword. Ephesians in the closing chapter. You take up the sword. You see? And uh, the sword is scripture. But actually the sword, folks sometimes say this is the sword. I know what they mean. But it's not actually. It's not actually. Because if you had to defend yourself against the devil by reading from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation, it would be a long job. No, that's not the sword. The sword is the scripture for the moment. The sword is the verse for the moment. Now, I've often spoken about this. Some have heard me say about this. But I'm going to say it again. If you do not know the, 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 the weapon, you cannot defend. Supposing you were a soldier and you were running down the battle and the enemy is coming up the other side and he meets you face to face and he's got his rifle pointed at you and you've got your rifle and you say to him, excuse me, I don't know how to work this. Could you give me half an hour to look up the manual and, and uh, uh, let me study what it says and then when I've studied what it said, maybe we can start again. And your enemy will say, oh, that's okay by me. I'll sit over here and have a Coca-Cola. And, and once you've learned how to use the rifle, well, I'll have a go at you again. Very kind enemy. Doesn't work that way. In other words, to search scripture in the middle of the crisis is too late. You've got to know it. Now, how are you going to know it? You're not going to know it by reading it for 10 minutes a day. You're going to know it by studying it becoming, making it become part of you, reading it, and you're going to read it and study it, and some days when you read it and study it, you'll say to your friend, I never got much out of it today, I never got much out of it today, but I tell you this, when the devil comes calling, the Spirit of God will bring the verse back to your mind. So young believers, I'm exhorting you to study the book, get into it, read it, spend time in it, and when others are out having fun, you are doing something 
about the serious business of getting to know your God. And by getting to know the Bible, the desire is not to know a book. The desire is to get to know the God behind the book. And so, when the enemy comes calling, you don't say, could you give me half an hour? You've got the answer. And so the Lord Jesus says, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. So, to obey Satan, to satisfy the flesh, would mean that he broke scripture. So in the question of provision, in the provision of how I live and how I spend my time and how I look after the things I have to look after, we do not break scripture. He deals with provision. Now look at the second one. All this power will I give unto thee. He's not dealing there with a problem of provision. He's dealing there with a problem of position. Do you see that? It's position now. I'll give you all this. You know what he showed him? You know what I believe he showed him? He showed him a moving panorama of the glory of every kingdom that ever would be. And he says, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. I'm the God of this age. I'll give it to you. All this power will I give unto thee. You know what the Lord Jesus said later? All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. The Satan, was, Satan was promising on power on earth. And it's the question of position. He seeks to make the natural more attractive than the spiritual. Now he'll always do that. He'll always make the natural things to you seem more attractive and worth pursuing than the spiritual. Now young believers will do it. The job will be worth more than the assembly. Money will be more worth more than your testimony. He'll tell you that. That these natural things are worth more. He says, I'm, I'm giving you all this. I'm showing you all this, he says. And it can be yours. And he seeks to make the natural more attractive than the spiritual. Now keep that in mind. He'll do that to you. Now, so it is firstly provision. It is secondly position. And then... Here is this remarkable. If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence. He shall go. What is it now? It's not no provision. It's not no position. But it's praise. You'll have the praise and the plaudits of the world if you do this. You'll get praise. You'll be a popular hero. You'll be, well, there's a lot of heroes today. Well, heroes for five minutes. You know, the world pumps up heroes. You go out there and there's a, there's a whole world of folks who are pumped up as being heroes simply for commercial purposes. And the very lowest of the low are elevated to being heroes so they get the praise and the plaudits of men. have nothing to do with all that sinful rubbish. But in your own heart, the devil might say, you know, let me give you an example. Supposing you're a young brother and you're gifted to preach the gospel and your brethren know that you are and it's quite obvious that you can preach the gospel and the devil and, and you maybe get a wee bit of uh, you maybe get a wee bit of work at work maybe speaking at the odd business thing and that sort of thing and, and you're good at it because these other boys have never stood on a platform but you're good at it boy are you good at it and you get up for ten minutes and because you're a gospel preacher, you know you know to use your alliteration, don't you? And you get away with it because your wife's not there, you know. <laughs> I'm letting a secret away. Yeah, you know, you, get, and you say, boy, you say, boy, and they say, boy, he's good. He's good. Look, well, he's good. How did he get that? And they say, how did you get Well, you don't say it because, because I preach the gospel. You say, oh, well, oh, humility. I've just got it, you know. <laughs> and so they say, well, we'll give you half an hour at the next and then, and instead of just your local branch, they're doing it for the whole of America. And then they're shipping you away over to ancient old places like Scotland, you know. And you're, you're standing there, and you're getting the praise of men. And the plaudits of men. And your appearances on the gospel platform get fewer and fewer. But in all these things, men are saying, "By what an orator. What a, what a speaker. He's the man to get. 
You know what you're doing? You're doing what Samson did. You know what Samson did? He had great strength from God. You know what he did? He was in a city in a bad situation. And when he was almost caught, he took the gates of the city, a great display of power before men, and he carried them up to Hebron and put them down. What you're doing is, and I see brethren doing it, and I say to my wife, they're carrying the gates so that men will be impressed by the spiritual power that the man has that he's using to the wrong end. And you get the praise and the plaudits. Says the devil, I'll give you provision. I'll give you position. I'll give you praise. And all you need to do is obey me. I was speaking to somebody today and he's saying that. I said it at Sarney and I say it often over in the UK as I look down at young people and it's great to see you and I've already said this to some of you I look down at you and I say I'm looking down at young folks and in making your mark for God some of you will make it some of you will make it the rest of you may stay in assembly fellowship all your life with unrealized potential. Christian life is full of folks who never realize their potential. I can think back to young men, and as they're now the age that I am, I can write over them the words, if only. If only. If only they hadn't taken that job. If only they hadn't taken that husband. If only they hadn't made that move. Today there would be a power for God. But they never made it. But I'm looking down and I hope I'm looking down on some of you who will make it. We want you to make it. And I always say then, I want you at the judgment seat to say to me, I proved you wrong. I proved you wrong. I made it. I made my mark. My life wasn't wasted. Young folks, you've an opportunity until you go to the glory, either by rapture or by way of death, to do something you will never be able to do after you get to heaven. Never ever again will you be able to serve Christ where he is rejected. And it's the only place you've got the opportunity. And here, tested. And as a young man and a young woman, you'll be tested. The Lord Jesus was tested at the beginning of his public ministry. And he came through using the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. So get to know the Scriptures. Take it in. Learn it. Make it part of yourself. So that when the devil comes calling you, you know to say, No, I tell you, it is written. And by the way, don't be afraid to speak to him. And do audibly. And just say, The Bible says... It is written, and the Lord Jesus knew what it was to handle the word of God competently. So we must leave that behind. So he was the, the devil was defeated. You know, for the very first time at the hands of a man, the devil retreated, defeated. Praise God for that. You know that? He retreated, defeated at the hands of a man. He'd never known it before. Complete rout, complete defeat. The Lord Jesus says, the prince of this world cometh, and he findeth nothing in me. What does it mean? There wasn't anything in the Savior to which the devil could appeal. Keep that in mind, because he's going to come calling. And that's what he's doing. Now, so there was confrontation. Now, I want just to deal now with his defeat at the cross. Now, I'm not going to deal with all this tonight because we'll be dealing with this tomorrow and in the week that comes. I'm not going to go into any of the detail of the cross. I'm just going to speak about his defeat, the defeat of the devil at the cross. What happened at the cross as far as the devil was concerned? Well, if I turn, turn over with me to Colossians chapter 1. What happened at the cross? Colossians chapter number 1. And down to verse number 22. In the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. The first thing I want you to notice at the cross is that the devil's purposes were thwarted. 
His purposes were thwarted at the cross. What was his purpose? His purpose was to stop you being anything for God's glory. And here, says the Apostle Paul, what has he done? Through the cross, he will be able to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. To present you without stain and without blame. What did he want to do? He wanted to make you sinners worthy only of judgment. But one day you will be presented to God stainless and sinless and pure. And so through the cross, through the cross, he thwarted the purpose of the devil. Praise God for that. But we'll take that a little further. And I want you to see, please, Hebrews chapter 2. Can we turn over to Hebrews chapter 2? Again, apart from turning to the scriptures, this keeps you awake. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 14. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. What did he do? Well, the first thing, his purposes were thwarted. The second thing was his power was broken. At Calvary, the power of the devil was broken. Now you might say to me, but how can the power of the devil be broken? How is that possible? After all, uh, folks still sin and I still sin, etc., etc. How is it possible for the power of the devil to be broken? Well, let me give you an example. And it's, it's one I often think about. Way back in 1988-89, uh, some of you won't even remember that. Imagine that. But in that day, communism fell in Europe at that time. Now, if you had lived there, you would have seen, for instance, that there was East Germany and West Germany, and there was a wall between them. And if you'd looked into East Germany, you'd have seen that the state was still there. The East German army was in place. Egon Krantz, a name that you've never heard of, consigned to the bucket of history, was Secretary General of the Communist Party in East Germany. He ended up in jail, but that's another story. And the border troops were there, and all the fortifications were there. Uh, the power of East Germany seemed impregnable. But its citizens were leaving every day. Because the Hungarians had opened up their border, so all they did was they travelled down into Hungary, and they came out through the Hungarian border into West Germany. You got the picture? The place looked impregnable. It was built to keep its citizens in the wall. Your president went over and stood 40 years ago. Ich bin ein Berliner. I'm a Berliner. Nobody could get out, nobody could get in. But they were all leaving. When the Hungarian border opened, the power of East Germany was rendered powerless. Now that's the thought. The thought in Hebrews is this, that the power of the devil has been bent at keeping everybody in. But at the cross, the way out was opened up. East Germany could do nothing about it. They could posture, they could make declarations, they could trumpet out their, 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 their slogans, but people were still, I tell you, this very day that soon will come to an end, the citizens of Satan's kingdom have been leaving, and there's nothing he can do about it. He can't do a thing about it, he can't stop them. The cross has opened up the way, and there's a way out, and the devil cannot keep them in. In that sense, through death he destroyed him that had the power of death and delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. How did he do it? Satan's weapon. This was the glory of the cross. Satan's weapon against men resulted in death. And death seemed the end of man. And Christ makes death the beginning of eternal life. And since I started speaking to you, Hundreds of his citizens have gone out and he cannot get them back. And they're leaving in droves. You might say, well, not in my... But over this wide world, they're leaving in droves. And the devil looks back impotently, powerlessly, and can do nothing to keep them in. Calvary has opened the way out. Praise God. Sometimes we sing hallelujah, what a saviour. We obviously don't do it here, but we do it in Scotland. 
Right. Now, so you see, you see all this. Uh, so the, the, the plans of the adversary were thwarted and the power of the adversary was broken. And I'm turning now to Philippians 2. Turn to Philippians chapter number 2, please. Philippians chapter number 2 and at verse 8 and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name now his purposes were thwarted his power was broken and his plans for himself were destroyed what do I mean? his plans why do you think the devil tacked Adam so ferociously. Why do you think? Why did he attack him so ferociously? Can I tell you why? Because Adam was made by God his vice regent on earth. Here is one. Now, the devil had been the attendants on the throne of his majesty, the anointed cherub. He had been in a place of great favor and had become subject to utmost folly. And he was cast out of the presence of God because of that. He's still called to account, as we know in the book of Job. And what was his plan? The devil's plan was to supplant God and to be the head of all. That was the devil's plan. I will ascend and be like the Most High. His plan was to be the governor of the universe. That was his plan. That was what he wanted. That's what his desire was. His desire was to be the governor. I will ascend and be like the Most High. And then with horror and with anguish and with anger, the devil suddenly sees that the man has to be God's ruler. A man has to be God's ruler on earth. And no doubt he even saw beyond that. Suddenly he saw that a man was to take the place that he coveted and desired and still sought. A man to supplant Lucifer, son of the morning. And he says, I'll bring him down. I'll bring him down. Now, in Philippians chapter 2, we learn this. That it will be a man who will be supreme over all. God also hath highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus not at the name of the adversary not at the name of Satan but at the name of Jesus at the name of a man every knee will bow I tell you his plans for himself were utterly thwarted by Calvary so his purpose for mankind was destroyed and so was thwarted and so his power was broken and so his plans for himself were destroyed he will not sit in that utmost throne but it will still be a man that which he tried to prevent and there will be a man I tell you what a thing it is in heaven tonight in the presence of God there's a man of flesh and bone now keep that in mind and so this was all behind him and he was defeated at the cross the Lord Jesus took up that weapon, death. That which the devil imagined to be his own creation, what he had brought about, and he took up death, and through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. Now we'll be speaking a lot more about that when we're speaking about the cross. I just want you to see how the plans of the devil were completely upset and destroyed at Calvary. What a saviour we have, who went through all that to thwart the ambitions of the devil. So, he was defeated in the wilderness. He was defeated at Calvary. How do I know? How do I know? <coughs> the devil felt that he had the power of death. Now, in what way did the devil have the power of death? The devil had the power of death because he could cause us to do what causes death. Cause us to sin. And I've said to some of you before, and I'll say again, and I'll be saying it this week, the Lord Jesus proved that Satan did not have authority over death, but he did. I've said some of this to you before. The Lord Jesus commanded death on five occasions. He commanded death 
when he stood by the funeral procession in Luke chapter 7 outside the gate of the city of Nain. He commanded death and a, a boy rose from a funeral bier and his mother took him. He took him and gave him to his mother and into the home they went. I've often said, I don't know what she did when she closed the door, but I think she gave him a big cuddle. He had power over death when he said, Talitha Kumai, little darling, I see unto thee arise. And he had power over death there. And again we see her rising. And he says to her, now give her something to eat. Why did he say that, by the way? Why did he say give her something to eat? Because having a healthy appetite is a sign, one of the signs of good health. Good health. My wife won't mind me repeating this story, but we learned that one of our sons used to take ill maybe on a, Sunday, a Monday morning going to school you know, he was all fushed and fevered he'd come through and say I'm not well not well mother said oh you better stay and you look terrible well, you're all warm but then half an hour later he'd come through and say can I have my breakfast she said yes and then get into the car and you go to school you know, because we then learned later what he used to do. If any of you want to do it, get a woolen jumper, rub your forehead for 20 minutes. And it gets very red and very warm. And then go and say to your mother, no, well. <laughs> but remember, before you come out of the bedroom a second time, rub it again. A lot of rubbing, you know. And make it warm. Now, why did mother know that he was well? Because he was up and he was walking about and he had a healthy appetite. So the Lord Jesus says to this girl who's walking about... Give her something to eat. Power of death. He controlled death outside of the tomb at Bethany. The dead that were in the graves heard his voice and the dead came out. But he showed his power over death on the cross. He was never ever a dying lamb. Men could not put him to death. It wasn't possible. No man taketh my life from me. And so at the appointed moment, he bowed his head and sent his spirit away. He controlled death. He commanded death to come. You see, but you said five times. In the dark of the morning of the first day of the week, from within death, he commanded death to go. And death fled. I tell you, my Saviour showed that he could not only command death from out with it, but he could command it while he was dead, in the place of the dead. So you see, he was alive, and he rose from the tomb, showing that death had no power over him. And so the power of the devil was broken. Now, we must, we must go on. It's half, half past eight, within it. It's half past eight. Yeah. Let's move on now. I want us to notice now, I've spoken about the great victory, the defeat of the devil at the hands of the Lord Jesus, in the wilderness and on the cross. I tell you, the hopes of the devil were crushed. That's why in the 40 days when he was with the disciples, that's why the devil never came calling. He was a defeated foe. The adversary's power was broken. Now, I want you to notice, and I think we should think about it just for a moment. I thought we should think for a moment about his defeat at our hands. How can we defeat him? You say, well, you've actually dealt with it when you are dealing and you're padding now and filling up. No, I'm not. I want to speak about his defeat at our hands. And I want you to notice, first of all, the danger that we are in because the devil is still stalking us. Remember what Peter says, your adversary has a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. By the way, that <laughs> if you look through the first epistle of Peter, you will find... Uh, that at the end it says and it's a much discussed expression the church that is at Babylon greater than and folks say wasn't he at Babylon at all I think he was I think he was because First Peter is full of references to Babylon a roaring lion well that's Daniel a fiery trial that's Daniel's friends honest amongst the Gentiles that's Daniel and his companions oh uh, Peter was walking about Daniel, uh, Babylon and he was thinking about all these things but that by the way that's got nothing to do with what I'm saying now I want us just to deal with you and the adversary and I want us to now 
There are, I can think of four dangers that face you from the adversary. Turn please to 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 6. What's the first danger that faces you from the adversary? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Ah, now I know this is to do with those who are seeking to be overseers, but nevertheless we learn this, that pride puts us in the danger of condemnation. We're going to get some C's here, by the way. So if you're going to let them down, just one big C and then you can have. The first is the danger of condemnation. Now, what does that verse mean? The condemnation of the devil is the condemnation suffered by the devil. Lest you fall into the condemnation suffered by the devil. And what was the condemnation suffered by the devil? He lost his place. He lost his authority. He lost his position. That was the condemnation suffered by the devil. So pride will cause me to lose my place. And I'm not thinking of a promoted post. I'm thinking of my place in the testimony. If I have pride, if I think I'm the greatest, and you know, I say, you know, uh, I remember a brother saying to me many years ago, maybe seven or eight years ago, you know, the brethren had a different view of his abilities than he had. He really did think he was a great preacher. I heard him twice, and the brethren were absolutely right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I know somebody in the meeting, or no, somebody in Timothy Folks, the meeting, said to me that some preachers sap from you the will to live as you're sitting under their ministry. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, <laughs> He certainly did that, you know. After 10 minutes, he wished it was all over. And, you know, he thought, and he said to me, John, he says, I don't understand it. He says, and I'm not being proud, he says, to be honest, I'm the best of the lot. I really am. He said, and there's no point, that's the truth. He said, you've got to face facts. And the fact is, I'm the best. And he says to me, what do you think? And I said, well, I think it's time for me to go, actually. But <laughs> no, <laughs> nevertheless, you know, do you do, I know you don't get a fault of that in America, but we have them, you know. We could expose some of them to you <laughs> with pleasure. You see, if I've got pride, I will look. That's the condemnation. That's what Paul, he fell into the condemnation suffered by the devil. And the condemnation suffered by the devil was he lost his play. And I'm not talking about promoted posts. I'm simply saying, if you are gifted of God, and every believer is gifted of God, brethren and sisters in some way, all gifted of God, well, you will lose your place for doing that in the testimony pride, the danger of condemnation. Now, turn with me again to 1 Timothy 3 and 7. One Timothy, please. And uh, verse 7, I think it is, of chapter number 3. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So, it's a danger, it's the question not only of being condemned, but of being captured. You fall into the snare of the devil. Now what does a snare do? It trips you up and captures you. So you see, the devil lays a snare and you're captured by it. Young believers, beware falling into condemnation. Beware falling into capture. It's a snare, you see, for this reason that the, the sins to which we are prone capture us, take us. We can't get away from them. Now I know you might say that's true of alcohol and drugs and all, but it's really true of a lot of most of the sins grip you and take hold of you and it's difficult to get out of them. Here you are and you say, well, I'm going to give up the work in the assembly for so many years or so many days or so many weeks because I want to concentrate on getting there and making it my ability to be rich. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with being rich if... But there's everything wrong with young believers making it their great objective in life to be rich. God might make you rich. But if you say that's my objective, 
You'll be captured by it. It will be as addictive as alcohol or drugs. It will capture you. And this is the snare of the devil. The snare is something that captures you and will not let you go. That's why he calls it the snare of the devil. When you get an animal in a snare, it captures it and it will not let it go. Beyond your power to open up. So there's the danger of being condemned, the danger of being captured. 1 Peter 5, please. One Peter five. Pages take longer to find when you're on the platform. One Peter, chapter number five. Here we are, and I want to read with you, please, uh, chapter five. Here we are. Do we get this? Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The danger of being consumed. Consumed. Whom he may devour. Do you notice that? The danger of being consumed. Now, now, now what does that mean, consumed? Peter is very graphic in his language. Your adversary the devil is walking about. He wants to feed on you. He wants to consume you. Now again, it's, it's a very graphic picture. You see, the picture of being ensnared is being captured and you can't get out. The picture of being consumed is a picture of being destroyed. It's a picture of being rendered completely incapable of doing anything. You will be consumed. It will consume you and make you part of itself. That's the thought of being consumed. It will make you part of itself. You become part of this whole device of the devil, consumed by it, sucked into it. That's what Paul is. That's what Peter is saying. You'll be sucked into it. You'll be consumed. So there's the danger of being condemned, the danger of being captured, the danger of being consumed, sucked into something. So you become part and partial of it. And you can't get out of it. It becomes part of your life, your way of life. All your life is round it. You're consumed by it. Your whole life now is governed by it. And it's impossible to break the ties and get out. That's what he's talking about. And he's seeking to consume you. Turn with me, please, to First First Corinthians. First Corinthians, please. Chapter 9, verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. Ah, the danger of being cast away. Sad, isn't it? What does it mean, cast away? To be cast away means to be disapproved for service. It doesn't mean that you're not saved. You're still saved. But you're disapproved for service. Now, says Paul, this body of mine. He's speaking about his body. He's speaking about controlling his body. Now listen, young believers, you control your body. Don't let your body control you. That's a fundamental thing in the Bible. Don't let the body control you. You control it. Now says Paul as he goes through, if I fail in this, and it's true of everything that the devil, I will become cast away, disapproved for service, no longer fit to serve, saved, but my life is such I am not fit to be part of a testimony of service for God. My testimony is outside as such that I cannot, I dare not be part of that testimony. What a sad thing. The danger, this is what the devil wants to do to you. He wants to see you condemned. He wants to see you captured. He wants to see you consumed. He wants to see you cast away. And that's what he's trying. And he's trying hard. But there is a man. And the devil wanted all that for him. And more. And he moved through triumphantly. The last. The second. He was never condemned or captured or consumed or cast away. And we saw that he used the word of God to bring that. And because of that. Now what do you do when you're tempted? 
You know what Paul says? He says a very simple thing when he's dealing with temptation. And, and I better get off this subject or uh, we will we'll never get finished. He, he, says, he says a very simple thing. He says this. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above all that you are able. I'm speaking about 1 Corinthians 10. In 1 Corinthians 10, you know, it's the lessons from Israel's failure. And he says this now, you will never be tempted by... Your temptations will not be unique. They have been suffered by other men, but God is faithful, and when you are tempted, He will pro He will provide a way of escape. Now you know what you could you know what you could translate that word way of escape. You could translate it a trap door. In other words, I'm coming back to what I said about a sinner unsaved. A sinner unsaved says, "I sinned and I couldn't help it." If a believer says that to you, it's not true. He could help it. Because with every temptation, God gives you a way out. God never puts you, allows you to get put in. In other words, when the devil tries to put you into a corner, God opens a door. They're God's doors, not the devil's. When the devil tries to tempt you, God provides you a trap door. God's trap door, not the devil's. And so, we see, for instance, the trap door for Joseph was to run. Nothing wrong with running from temptation run that was the trap door that was the way out for God provided a way out and you can see it right through scripture the trap door for David was to come down out of the roof of the palace and never again at that time of the day to walk there he failed to take it and in one act he broke three of the commandments sad I tell you tonight the devil and his, and, and his cohorts will come calling. Condemn you, capture you, consume you, or make you cast away. <coughs> the scripture tells us quite clearly about this. It tells us, for instance, in Ephesians 4, I don't ask you to turn to this, and I know we're turning to a lot of scriptures this afternoon, but I don't ask you to turn to this. He does say something quite clear. Neither give place to the devil. The first thing is, don't give him the opportunity. Don't give the devil the opportunity. You see, how we avoid it, let me say again, I'm thinking of all the problems there. Now, how do I avoid it? Don't give the devil the opportunity. Neither give place to the devil. Now, how, do I, how can I give place to the devil? Very simply, I can watch or read or listen to what is salacious. I'm letting the devil in. I will never have in my house anybody who curses and takes the name of the Lord in vain. But I'm quite happy to listen to it and watch it. I'm giving place to the devil. I would never go to these places, maybe where the whole thing is immoral, but I might buy a magazine and read about it and look at it. And I'm giving place to the devil. I will never go to these drinking houses and all that kind of thing. I might be happy to do it when nobody's watching. I'm giving place to the devil. Don't give him the opportunity. Neither give place to the devil. When I think of Ephesians number 6, and this is just emphasizing what I said earlier today, Ephesians number 6 uh, and verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, do you notice the wiles of the devil? Have you ever looked at that word wiles? Some of these words used to trouble me. I, I was very troubled when I learned that the word that is disciple and the original is the word that we get mathematics from. I was horror stricken by that. Surely to be a disciple, you had to be a mathematician. I loved geometry. I loved arithmetic. The peak of my attainment in algebra was 19 out of 20. And that was after a lot of effort. And the uh, math teacher came and sat beside me and said, Grant, how is it you managed to do so well this time? 
19%. Mind you, the way they, the way they do exams in Scotland now, that would be a pass mark, because nobody fails. You know? And then I learned that the word actually meant a learner, a pupil. But this word, the wiles of the devil, is an interesting one. It's the word that we get our English word, or American word, now I'm over here. We get our word method. It is against the methods of the devil. Now, now, why does that word get used method? Because the devil, you know, I want you to notice that the devil is not a divine person. He is a created being. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He's not omnipresent. But he has intense intelligence. And you know, he examines us and he knows us and he has worked out structured methods. When he attacks you, it's not just a random attack with no method about it. Oh, he's got method and skill and cunning about his attack. And you know this? He knows my weak points better than I know them myself. And he'll touch them better than I know them myself. Now, says the apostle, he says, don't give him the opportunity. And secondly, in Ephesians, don't stand unprotected. Put on the whole armor of God. Don't stand unpredicted. And the whole armor of God is not just the scripture. It's living a righteous life. It is doing as God would have us do. You look at the whole armor of God. Stand like a Roman soldier. With the whole armor on you. And if you've never read. And you want some light reading. Read of the legions of Rome. And you'll learn what a Roman soldier did. Stand, says the apostle. So keep that in mind. We have taught to stand unprotected. In the book of James, please. The book of James, please. Verse 7 of chapter 4. Resist the devil, and he will flee unto you from you, draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your heart, you sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So, don't give them the opportunity. Don't stand unprotected. And don't be unresisting. Resist them. <coughs> Do you notice? Resisting him is linked to turning to God. The two things are the same. Resist him. Don't just fall to him. Tell him and resist him. And I tell you, if you do that, and you look for the way of escape, the way of escape that is provided every time there's a temptation, look for it. It's like being in a room, and how, how do I get out of this room? You say, exit, out you go. You don't stand there. If you're in a burning building and you saw an exit, you wouldn't just sit and look at it. You would run out, says Paul, get out. There's a way of escape. And the devil's hedged you up, but I've provided a door. Remember, every wall that the devil builds, God puts a door in it. The devil builds it and God punches a door in it. And you can get out. And that really is what... Now, the time has passed very quickly. We really haven't finished everything, but we won't. So the Lord Jesus, uh, so the Apostle Paul, and I'm turning now just in closing to 1 Corinthians 15. I know you've been turning over. Yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. This chapter has to do with resurrection. It's an interesting chapter. If you look at it, the opening four verses are the proclamation of resurrection. From verse number 5, it's the proof of resurrection. From verse number 35, it's the problems associated with resurrection. <laughs> And from verse number 50, it's the process of resurrection. By the way, that all starts with peace. Right. So there you've got it. Now he says, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The first man, Adam. I hope there's nobody here that believes that there was a creation on earth before Genesis 1. I hope you haven't been reading Earth's earliest ages. <coughs> a creation on Earth before. And it was because of that creation was destroyed and all that. And these big dinosaurs were destroyed 926 million years ago. Well, that's maybe an exaggeration. I'm sure. <laughs> oh, you've heard of the man, haven't you? At least you must have. 
Everybody knows the joke. I always think of the, the museum curator who was asked how old was this dinosaur. He says, four million and thirty years old. And he says, how do you know? He said, well, I started here thirty years ago and they told me it was four million years old. <laughs> so it's now four millions and thirty years old, isn't it? Well, <laughs> I, I hope you don't believe that. The first man, Adam. There was nobody before him. He was made a living soul. God breathed into him the breath of life. Now here's the contract. The first Adam had life breathed into him. But this Adam, the Lord Jesus, the last Adam, it's not that he had life breathed into him, but he breathed life into others. So he's greater. Adam received life, but the Lord Jesus gives life. Adam was the head of a race that received life from God. Christ is the head of a race, and everyone has received life from him. The first Adam was a life receiver. This Adam was a life giver. What a contrast. What a contrast. No wonder Paul includes us. And then do you notice this? The first man is of the earth earthly. The second man from heaven. The first man had his source on the dust of the earth. He was created out of the dust of the earth. He was an earthy man. But this man found his source in heaven. He came out of heaven. So in both these ways, this Adam, the last Adam, the second man, is far superior to the first. And the moment I receive Jesus Christ as my saviour, I leave the family of the first Adam and I'm transferred into the family of the last Adam. That's what happened when you get saved. The federal heads, one life receiving, who destroyed it in the garden by sinning. Other life giving. The one out of the dust of the earth, the other came out of heaven. No wonder Paul includes that in that glorious resurrection. And he says, as is the earth, is such are the, as, it's such, as we have borne the image of the earth, we shall also bear the one day. We will bear that image completely of him. What a day that will be when that bursts on our sight. Just as I close, I think of what man was to be. It's interesting to note what man wants to be. The likeness and the image of God. What's the difference between the two? What's the difference between likeness and image? Likeness resembles, image represents likeness resembles in other words man in the sense that he was to have authority and he was to have power that, that resembles likeness resembles image represents and presents to others that's what we were to be but in Christ we can be that we can be like him being Christ like and we are thus fit to represent him to others. What was destroyed in the garden? One thing I failed to mention, that clock again. Preachers should have a little thing that they can stop the clock going and every watch in the room until the meeting's over. If you want it patented, you'll find a lot of takers. You remember... Adam had all the animals brought before him and he gave them names. Now I know some folk laugh at that and say, oh, he saw this creature come and says, that's a giraffe. And he saw that creature come and says, that's a rabbit. And he saw this creature, he says, that's a hedgehog. And that's a squirrel. Well, I've heard it laughed off like that, but really, no, that's not in the thought of calling them names at all. The thought is that Adam had every animal brought before him and he understood its purpose in God's creation and he named it accordingly. The name 
meant the character of the thing. He understood what the whole of creation was all about. He understood why there was that animal, why there was that one, why there was that one, what was its purpose, what God intended it to do in the creation, telling me that every single creature has a purpose. And he gave it a name. He knew everything. How much have we lost? We don't know that today. That, 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 that information's all lost to us. We don't know. I mean, we see a squirrel. We have a squirrel that goes about the garden. My wife feeds it in the garden. The, the, the farmers tear their hair out. They kill them. They shoot them. That'll soon be banned as well. But they shoot them. My wife feeds them because they're nice and furry. You know? But why is there a squirrel? Why we squirrel around? It's got a purpose. Got a purpose. Adam knew it all. Think of where we are now. But just think of this. That one day we will bear the image of the heavenly in all its fullness. To be like him. That doesn't mean that we will physically look physical, have the physical light. It means that in character and in everything we will just be like him. What a day that will be. Far greater than being like Adam. The first Adam. The last Adam. Young brethren and sisters, if you know, if you are saved by God's grace, if you're not saved by God's grace, but as I call you brethren and sisters, I'm speaking to those that are, are, you know this, being a Christian is the best life you can live. And you know, getting to know this book is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And no matter what knowledge is thrown at you, it's useless if it's not based on the fear of the Lord. And if it's not in accord with scripture, it's wrong. It's as simple as that. We don't need to argue about it. If it's contrary to scripture, it's wrong. It's wrong. So there we are. And God willing, tomorrow we will continue our studies and we'll be moving over a little more onto the cross tomorrow. Thank you for your patience and for your attention.